um, good to be here. Let me get my Bible a second. <laughs> don't want to forget that. Hey, if you have your Bibles, why don't you open them up? We're going to be in Matthew chapter 7 today, continuing our series, Upside Down Kingdom, going through the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, we began by looking at the Beatitudes. Now we're uh, going through the rest of Jesus' sermon, and uh, we know it's focused on the kingdom of God. And so that's what we're going to be continuing with. Before I get to it, though, um, just wanted to let everyone know a couple things that have been going on at the church. Um, first of all, I'm going to be gone next week, and we're getting um, uh, a pastor from down in Parkersburg. He's going to be coming up and uh, doing the service next week. So we get to go see some family, and uh, we get to spend some special time tomorrow, uh, Lord willing, with Precious's grandma. And uh, so probably be our last time with her, but uh, we're excited to just be able to be able to get over there and uh, spend some last hours with her. So, so that is special. But we're going to be doing some time with family. We'll be gone next Sunday, uh, but uh, make sure you come out for that. His name is Kyle Mann. He attended... Um, same school, school with Wayne, actually. Um, I, I talked to him about that, and they, there was a connection there, so that was neat. He's from Bible Baptist in Parkersburg, so I don't know what he's speaking about, but uh, I'm sure it's going to be good, so make sure you're there. Um, one thing you see in your bulletins uh, is that um, right on the bottom there, you see this Discover thing right there. You're probably wondering, what in the world is that? This is something new that we are starting as a church uh, we've been getting a lot of uh, people into our church that are maybe new to it and maybe not yet connected to the ministries or don't know how to get involved with children's church or um, Sunday school or uh, say, our, say our small groups that we do, different things like that. Um, if you want to know more about how you can get connected to the church, how you can serve, um, maybe you want to know what, what we're all about, why we're here, this is for you. So whether you've been here a few months or maybe a couple weeks or whatever, um, if you're not even a member yet uh, of the church, we'd love to just tell you what we're all about. And we're going to have a dinner on August the 28th after church. And that is just to, to treat you guys like royalty because we're glad that you are here and we want to just help you connect in, in the best way that you can. So that is August 28th. And then there is on our website a form online. If you're, if you're planning on coming, you can fill that out and let us know. It's not required. We're going to have plenty of food, though. So um, that's August 28th, and that is, that is for you. We got some other announcements. I'm not going to talk about them, though. We'll let Wayne do that at the end of the service, but I just wanted to let you guys know about that. That is a pretty special thing coming up. I also wanted to say a huge thank you. Who was here last Sunday? Yeah, like almost all of us. Wasn't it a good Sunday? We loved it. Um, having uh, Mission Sunday, having the Yaters here, and then the, the West Virginia mascot, the Mountaineer. My goodness, couldn't have been any better. So I, I just wanted to extend a special thank you to Annette for planning all that. Let's, let's give Annette a huge thank you. Thank you, Annette. Also, one more person that, that we haven't got to formally thank as a church but uh, two weeks ago, we ended VBS, or started VBS, I think. <laughs> it's been a busy two weeks. Um, and uh, the, the lady behind that was Millie Lee, who she did a whole lot of, of uh, administrative work behind the scenes, talking to people, organizing, and uh, really pulled it off with just such ease. So we really want to thank Millie for all the time and, and uh, energy that she put into the ministry of VBS. Why don't we thank her as well? Thank you, Millie. <laughs> Now, of course, we don't want to discount the people that serve every day, uh, every week within the church. You guys, everyone is valuable here, and uh, we appreciate everyone. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be a church without, without each other serving, and uh, that, is, that is what we want to encourage here. People using their gifts, the ways that God has gifted them to the best of their ability. So I, I'm grateful for seeing God at work in our church in that way. Hey, why don't we have a word of prayer before we get into Matthew and uh, just just uh, open up our service in that way. God, we're grateful we can spend time in your word today. Lord, uh, this, this verse is, these verses are very well known to us that we're going to be talking about, God, but often they're misunderstood by our world. And so, God, I, I pray that you would help me to bring clarity to your word today that, uh, God, the, the truth that you were teaching, Lord, may be conveyed in, in the way that, Lord, you had in mind. 
God, may your spirit convict us of our sinfulness. And uh, God, that we would just cling more and more to your righteousness, God. We love you and we're thankful, God, for our church family. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, as I said, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew chapter 7. Before we get into the text this morning, I, I was doing a little bit of research. Uh, Barna, if, if, if you're unfamiliar with Barna, they, they do a lot of studies, um, particularly among churches in the Christian world. And they do this study every single year. It's called the State of the Bible. A uh, little survey that they do. They, they survey thousands of people across, across the U.S. And this is what they came up with last year. Um, they said this. Fewer than half of all adults can name the four Gospels. Wow. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Fewer than half adults can even name those. Uh, they said this. Many professing Christians cannot identify more than two or three of Jesus' disciples. 60% of Americans cannot name five of the Ten Commandments. That's pretty sad. 82% of Americans, they believe that God helps those who help themselves is in the Bible, that it's a Bible verse. It's not. <laughs> Sorry, folks. <laughs> um, there was a survey of graduating high school seniors that revealed that over 50% thought that Sodom and Gomorrah were husband and wife. <laughs> In case you didn't know, it was two cities. <laughs> All right, and uh, last one here. A considerable number of respondents to one poll indicated that Billy Graham was the one who preached the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, we know all about the Sermon on the Mount. We're almost through it, okay? We know it wasn't Billy Graham. But, uh, you know, uh, this survey, I, I, didn't, I didn't bring it up just to, you know, make you feel stupid if you didn't know some of these, the answers to these questions. I think what it, what it really does is it shows us the, the, the level of biblical literacy in our society today, doesn't it? I mean, not, not many people read their Bibles. Not, not many people are, are found on a Sunday morning coming to Sunday school, learning about, uh, learning about Scripture. Not many are found having devotions or, or doing deep inductive Bible studies. Uh, it's just not something that people do. We're, we're preoccupied with a lot of other things. And because of that, our biblical literacy has really suffered. Now, just because our biblical literacy is, is way down doesn't mean that people don't know some verses in the Bible, okay? What, what, what's one verse you think people would really know in the Bible? It'd be probably John 3, verse 16, right? The, the football stadium verse, okay? Doesn't Tim Tebow, didn't he used to put it under his eyes, right? Um, people know that verse, right? But I would say today that probably the most popular verse that people know out of the Bible is Matthew 7, verse 1. If you didn't have your Bible open yet, I want you to turn there because uh, this is where we are this morning. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, okay? And uh, we're going to be spending time in, in that passage. It says there in Matthew, Judge not that you be not judged. Can't you just hear people saying that? People that don't even know Jesus? Don't judge. Stop judging. Judge not that you not be judged, right? You hear people say that all the time, don't we? But did Jesus mean what they mean when they quote that verse? I mean, when, when people say that verse, often, often I, I hear them saying, well, stop, stop judging me for what I do. You have no right to tell me that this is right or this is wrong or to stop or to start doing something, okay? Stop judging. Stop judging me, right? Do we as Christians have a responsibility to judge? Or did Jesus tell us right here, don't judge. Don't worry about other people, okay? They'll take care of themselves. I judge them, okay? So, so you don't judge. Is that what Jesus meant? Or did he mean something else? That is what we're talking about today, okay? Unfortunately, as we look in this passage in, in Matthew, we are going to start off by looking at the context of Scripture, okay? Um, because people take this verse and they rip it violently out of the context from which it came. Was Jesus actually putting a blanket statement saying, don't ever judge any time ever for any situation? 
No, he wasn't. And we're going to see that right off. So I have two um, things for you guys to fill out. Uh, two, two ways that we are going to just summarize Jesus' teaching here. First, he is giving a prohibition, okay? That's number one. The self-righteous judging he is prohibiting, okay? That is what he's dealing with here. Secondly, he's dealing with speaking about how we should righteously judge, okay? Did you know we are called to judge? I'm going to get to that in a little bit. First, we need to understand, though, in these first few verses, how we are not to judge, and that is self-righteously. This verse in Scripture says in Matthew 7, verse 1, again, if you don't have your Bibles open, please open them, because you need to see the context of where we're going. I'm going to be jumping around a little bit in Matthew today, and not just staying right here. Um, so it'd help if you had your Bibles open to this spot. It says, judge not that you be not judged. That's verse one, okay? So is all judging prohibited? Well, if you took this verse on its own, then yes. But if you take it in context, then no. I'm going to explain that, okay? The top three rules of Bible interpretation are this. Context, 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 okay? Please remember that. Uh, look at the immediate context of Matthew, and we'll see if all judging is prohibited. If you look at uh, Matthew 7, verses 5 through 6, glance down there for a second. Verses 5 and 6, you see two examples of judging. It says, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, then you'll be able to see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Judging. Do not give to dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn and attack you. Two examples of judging here, judging one another, okay? So not all judging is prohibited. It's just we've got to do it in the right way. Obviously, was, you know, Jesus was clarifying here. We're going to talk about those verses more in a few minutes. If you glance down to verse 15, here is a third example of judging. Just within this chapter, it says, Beware of false prophets. Verse 15, Who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Here we are called again to judge. Judge who? Judge between a true and a false prophet. How, is, how are we to judge? We'll recognize them by their fruits. We've got to judge whether they have good fruit or rotten fruit. Okay? That's how we determine whether a true or false prophet is. Okay? Judging. If you flip over to Matthew chapter 18, keep your, Bible, keep, keep your finger there in chapter 7. This whole passage that talks about judging within the church, uh, specifically judging sin within the church, going on amongst believers. Uh, here in Matthew 18, verse 15, this whole passage, is, this whole chapter is full of it, but it says, verse eight, verse, verse, chapter 18, verse 15, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Okay? This, this passage is all about, about judging sin for the purpose of restoration. It's the purpose of, of loving someone that is falling deep into sin. That, that is, is, it is the loving thing to do to go and confront that person about their sin and lovingly restore them back into the body. Okay? And so, so that's Matthew. There's a whole lot more in Matthew we could go to. What about the rest of the context of the Bible, though? You don't have to turn to these passages. One, one is, one is uh, uh, encouraging us in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Make moral judgments. In fact, Scripture commands us that all the time. Make moral judgments. It says, Galatians 6, verse 1, Brothers, if anyone is caught in sin, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. That's important. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. If someone, again, is caught in sin, we who are spiritual, we who know God's word, who are trying to follow it, we have a responsibility to our brother or sister who has fallen into sin to go and seek to restore them gently. Okay? So we've got to make a judgment to determine if someone is falling into sin, okay? It's, it's got to be something outwardly because we can't judge the heart, okay? And Jesus is teaching us that. We can't judge the heart. We've got to judge outward sin. If someone is sinning, we've got to 
pointed out. We've got to judge it. We've got to seek them out. We've got to exhort them to stop and return to God and to his word and to his ways, okay? There's a lot of other passages. We don't have time to go to them today. If you want to write them down, Romans 16, John 7, 1 Corinthians 5, Philippians 3, verse 2, okay? All these, these passages deal with how we are to judge, okay? So, I think we've, we've made a foundation that it is unbiblical, it is wrong to take Matthew 7, verse 1, just as it says, and to quote it on its own as a blanket statement to say, don't ever judge. That's wrong. It's simply wrong. It, it really is. It's not teaching us as Christians that, that we should just accept everyone's morality and, and never tell anyone that, we're wrong, that, that they're wrong, okay? He's not telling us that. He's actually saying the opposite. He's saying, when you do, make sure that this is in place. Make sure that you are not being hypocritical yourself. Make sure that you are not doing it for personal gain or being self-righteousness to boost, your, uh, boost up your own spiritual ego. Okay? That's what he's saying. So, one point we need to make before we move on is this. We make moral judgments all the time. We do. Um, you know, we, we have an election coming up, don't we? We've got two candidates, and, uh, you know, it's, it's been confirmed. They've, they've been appointed, and uh, now we've got a moral judgment to make, don't we? Who are we going to vote for, right? Who can we vote for, okay? I'm not going to tell you who you should vote for, but I, I'm just going to tell you right now, none of these two can, candidates represent God or his kingdom, okay? They're both immoral to the core, okay? But... Uh, we make moral judgments all the time, and we should. That's how our country works. That's how, how life here works, okay? If we don't make moral judgments, then everything is chaos. We're living in a society that's saying, no, don't make moral judgments. Do whatever you want. You know, if, if it's right for him, that's fine. He can, he can do it as long as it's not breaking the law. But we make moral judgments all the time, okay? Is all judging prohibited? No. What type of judging is prohibited? Self-righteous, hypocritical judging. Maybe you could call it hypercritical judging, okay? Because we can do that. If you think about our society, what, what do um, police officers, lawyers, um, principals, parents, coaches, pastors, all these positions have in common? It's really that they've got to make moral judgments. They've got to make judgments based on what they see, okay? Could you imagine if, if someone was speeding through town and uh, an officer's lights turned on, started, started to pull him over, the guy pulled over, and officer came to the window and said, Sir, do you know what the speed limit is? He said, Yes. It's 35 here in town. Well, I caught you going 55 miles an hour. Yes, I understand, officer, I was going 55 miles an hour, but, but I feel like you're judging me, okay? <laughs> what, if everyone, what if everyone did that, okay? What does the police officer have as a standard for judgment? He's got the law, okay? He's got that sign that says 35 miles per hour. That is the law, okay? And guess what, as Christians... We also have the law, okay? No, we're not under the law. We're under grace. But guess what? God has a standard for us to follow as, as a standard for morality and what, we, what is right and what is wrong. And it is right here in God's word, okay? We're not using our own standards of what we think is right or wrong. No. When we judge, it's based on God and his word, okay? So get that clear. What kind of judging is prohibited? Self-righteous, opinionated, critical judging, okay? So, when we're in Matthew, we remember the audience that Jesus was speaking to. We remember that he was speaking to scribes and the Pharisees and also Jesus' disciples, okay? And, and you know, often throughout Scripture, we see that Jesus was very hard on the scribes and the Pharisees, wasn't he? In, in fact, I'd say that out of any group of people, he was the most hard on these people because they were the most prone to be self-righteous. They were the most prone to, to think that, that it was their way, their own 
code of morality that, that got them to heaven, okay? There, theirs was a works-based religion. And so Jesus was, was pointing this out to him, to, to these scribes and these Pharisees, because they were the ones that, that self-righteously judged people over and over again. And, and by their promotion of their own self-righteousness, guess what they were doing? They were denying the gospel. They were saying, well, here's, here's the standard that we made up. And so we know that we can keep it, okay? But you're way down here, okay? And, and you, you can't do it. So we're going to judge you and we're going to make ourselves feel really good. And that's what was happening over and over again, okay? They were building themselves up when they judged other people. In fact, there's an example of this in Matthew chapter 22, verses 25 through 28. That, that speaks about how the scribes and the Pharisees, they, they judged other people. Um, it says in verse 25 of Matthew chapter 23, Matthew chapter 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. In other words, you look good on the outside, but guess what? Inside, you're hypocritical. You're disgusting. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate. Then the outside may also be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs. Here's, here's a disgusting example. Which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and uncleanliness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Hey, what, what Jesus is doing is he's, he's saying, hey, look at you Pharisees, you scribes, guess what? Here's what you look like. You look like a nice, beautiful cup, all ready to drink, Okay. Nice, full, of, full of nice, cool water. People see you're outside. And they're like, man, he's shiny. He's, he's all put together, right? I'd, li I'd like to get to know him. But guess what? He says, on the inside, you are disgusting. You're full of hypocrisy. You're full of trash, okay? You put on a good show on the outside, but, but you got to get the inside cleaned up first because you're so full of self-righteousness, you haven't even received me. You're denying the gospel by saying, I I'm just filling up myself with all, all these things that I think are good. But on the inside, guess what? They don't measure up. They're trash. They're worthless rags, as, as, as Paul said, right? He said, clean the inside of the cup, that the outside then may be clean, okay? Clean, clean the, the, the inside of the plate, okay? Clean it all off. That the outside then may be clean, okay? It's the inside, it's the heart that, that Jesus was talking about that we need to consider when we're judging. We can't judge the heart. God does that, okay? So here he's hammering the scribes and the Pharisees for their hypocrisy, their self-righteous judging. See, if you're the one that makes the rules, guess what? you're going to always be the one that's able to play the game the best, right? And that's what they were doing. They were making the rules. They were making them up. They were adding to the law. And that's why they always look down on other people. Now, when we get to verses 3 through 5, we see this. I'm going to skip verse 2 for right now. We'll come back to it. He gives us some illustrations. He says, Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye but do not notice the log that is in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, then you will be able to see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Okay, so here, what, he, what he's doing is, basically he's, he's using an example of, a log, okay? Basically, we don't know what size this log was, but by, by our terms, it was something that was used for building, okay? That'd be like a four by four today. Here's something from my house. It's like a 
four by three. It's pretty interesting, okay? It's solid. My house was made out of this. I took this out of one of my walls. Um, but he's saying, guess what? You guys, when you're promoting your own self-righteousness, guess what? It's like uh, a log stuck in your eye, okay? You can't see, okay? And, and then you look ridiculous to, to try and, uh, could, I, could I try and take a speck out of your eye? You can't do that, okay? You're blind and you don't even know it, okay? A log in your eye. That's what Jesus is saying. That's what you look like. You look ridiculous because I see it all. I see everything. You're not fooling anyone, okay? Especially me. And so these Pharisees and these scribes has had this attitude of superiority. And we see that also in the book of Luke where there's one of these scribes that's praying. Actually, it's a Pharisee. It says in Luke chapter 18, verse 11, I'll, I'll read it for you and you'll recognize it. It says that there was a Pharisee who was standing by himself praying to God, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I have. Okay, that's the outside. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Folks, when we're told to judge, the purpose is not to exalt ourselves. It's to humble ourselves like that tax collector did. Even though in the eyes of the world he was looked down on as being immoral and a thief, guess what? He knew his sin. He knew that he needed Christ. Whereas this Pharisee, he just boasted about his own works. It's not the place God wants us to be. See, our own self-righteousness, it can blind us. It has a way of doing that. It, it did it for David. Remember David in, in Scripture when uh, he sinned with Bathsheba? He, he was on his roof minding his own business. And guess what? There comes along a beautiful lady on the, on the other roof. And there she strips down naked and starts bathing. Okay, and, and you know he was tempted just to look away. But no, he looked in and he lusted. And then he, he sent, sent a messenger over to her house and said, hey, why don't you come over to the king's palace? They slept together. She got pregnant. And then she, he had the husband to deal with. Husband was gone away at, at war. He came back. He tried to get Bathsheba to, to sleep with him so that he'd think that the kid was his. Guess what? He didn't. He was so loyal to the king. And, and to the army that he slept on the doorstep. He wouldn't even go in his own home. And guess what? David said, well, I've got to deal with it somehow. So I'm going to place Bathsheba's husband on the front line. And then I'm going to draw back my army so that the, the enemy comes in and attacks and he's killed. Okay, essentially David committed adultery and then deceived and then murdered someone. Okay, three very blatant sins, okay? And then along comes the prophet Nathan to reveal his sin for him. And he did it in the form of a story. I want to want to read it for you, okay? To show you how David's self-righteousness blinded him. Nathan said this in Samuel 12, 1 through 7, said that there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had, a, had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink of his cup and lie in his arms. And it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. 
Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man and said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, this man who has done this thing deserves to die, and he shall restore this lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. David got it, okay? David said, this is wrong, okay? This, this poor, poor little guy, he only had one lamb, and, and this other man was rich and had thousands of them. And he took the poor man's. That's just wrong. Well, Nathan responded to David, you are that man. You are him. He didn't see it. He was blind. He was blinded by a big log in his eye. He thought that he was righteous, obviously. I mean, God called David a man after his own heart, right? What more do you have to have, right? but it blinded him. He wasn't all that he thought he was cracked up to be. His sin was blinded. Okay? So in David's self-righteousness, he couldn't see his own sin. And so getting back to Matthew, let's remind ourselves again, what type of judging is prohibited by Jesus? It's the self-righteous hypocritical, hypercritical judging. Why is it prohibited? Here's the answer. We are not God. Let's look at, uh, maybe I skipped that verse. Oops. Um, Look at verse one in your Bible. Look at verse one, uh, verses one and two in Matthew seven. I want you to read those verses a second. And uh, here's the answer to why we are not to judge. Judge not that you be not judged, For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Okay, here's why we're not to judge. Because we are not God. That's why we're not to judge hypocritically or self-righteously, okay? Now, in verse 1, although the name of God isn't mentioned right here, it's strongly implied, okay? And, and we call that divine passive, okay? Here's what verse 1 means, okay? If you're reading it, judge not that you be not judged by God. We've got a judgment to face. The point is that God is the ultimate judge, not you, not me. We cannot judge the heart. We cannot judge motives. And so when it comes to judging, guess what? We're only left with outward specific sin that we're told to judge. And we're going to get to that in a sec. When we sinfully judge others, their heart, their motives, guess what? We're taking on the role of God. And we cannot be God. We assume that we have all the facts. And that we understand someone else's motives perfectly. But we don't. Okay? Furthermore, verse 2 makes it clear that if we judge someone by a certain standard, that means that we also should be judged by that standard as well. Okay? Um, Scripture has a lot to say about those that lead, those that are pastors or teachers. Guess what? It says that you will be judged by a higher standard than others. Guess why? Because you taught it. Okay, if you taught it, if you, you told someone to, to do that, guess what? That means that you understand it, and so you're going to be judged by that much higher of a standard than others. That's scary. Okay, that, that's a position that, that many of us that teach in the church find ourselves in. And so we need to make sure that our life matches what we teach. Otherwise, it's worthless, and we're going to be judged more strictly. Okay, so if we think about that just just in a common sense, uh, maybe if we condemn those that break their commitments, guess what we need to ask ourselves? Do I break my commitments? Maybe if we condemn those that that struggle with with lust, do I struggle with lust? Maybe if those uh, we see someone struggling with with um, stealing, have you ever stole something? Okay? Now, I'm not saying that, that you know, if, if you're guilty of that sin, that you should never call someone else out on it. It's just that, that our focus should be different because guess what? We are all sinners and we, we stand in need of God's grace and his righteousness. If you've trusted in Jesus, you've received it. So when you judge, guess what? You're saying, I struggle with this as well. You need to be forgiven of it as well. 
saying, I, I'm, no, I'm no better than you, okay? And that's what's, what brings us to this second point here. Uh, okay, there's the verse where ju- righteous judging is to be practiced. Here's Jesus' point. Righteous judging is to be practiced. Two examples here are given of good judging or how we are to judge rightly. And it's found in verses 3 through 5. I know we've read these already, but um, let's, uh, let's read them again. First point is this. As we get to the text, we are to call to judge other believers humbly. We are called to judge other believers humbly. Whenever we judge, that is how we are to do it. Let's read verses 3 through 5 again with this in mind of how we are to judge humbly. It says this, Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye, when there's a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So the, uh, verse 5, it indicates that we should take the log out of our own eye so that we can help our brother get the speck out of his eye, okay? It doesn't say, oh, well, you take the log out of your own eye and just let God deal with the other person. It doesn't say that. It says take the log out of your eye, literally, okay, so we can have an illustration of it, okay? Get that thing out of your eye, okay, (laughs) so that you can go help your brother, okay? But you're to do it humbly, okay? How do you take the log out of your eye? How do you do it? That, that would be the main question that we need to answer for ourselves if we are ever going to live and judge righteously. How do you get this stinking thing out of your eye? We all have them, right? Guess what? We need to take it out. And I have this here as well. We need to look to the cross. We need to take these nails that, that we know bore our sin We need to think about it like this, where Jesus, his nails were hammered into this cross for us. And we need to think of our sin as that log in our eye. Jesus, you did that for me. You dealt with my sin. You took the log out of my eye. Okay? You took my self-righteousness. You took what I, what I thought was good. Okay? Guess what? It didn't measure up. It was sinful. And when, when you see yourself, when you look at that log as on the cross, you think of all your sin that Jesus had dealt with. Guess what? You can't look at that cross and not be remorseful. That someone else paid the debt that you owed. Someone else died for your sin, okay? You can't look at the cross and be self-righteous and and critical at the same time, okay? You just can't do that. Because if, if you look at the cross and you don't see anything, then you're not truly saved. You don't understand the gospel, if yours is, is a works-based religion of I did this, I did that, I go to church, I'm a member of this church, I've been saved since I was a kid because my kids took my, my parents took me to Sunday school. If that's you and you don't understand that Jesus took your sin, you don't understand the gospel. Okay? You gotta understand the gospel. You gotta say, Jesus, you forgave my sin. And so when I see someone else sin, I see my own on the cross, and I see that Jesus also paid for that as well. And so I'm not going to be critical. I'm not going to be boastful of making myself look better than someone else when I say, hey, you know, I see that you're struggling with, with lust. Can I help you? I see that you're struggling with, with taking things that aren't yours. I see that you're struggling not, not being faithful to your commitments. Why don't you come alongside me and we'll learn together, okay? That's what judging looks like. We're all on an even playing field when we see the cross. 
when we see the sin that Christ bore for us, okay? Inversely, we also see that if, if we, if we are, keep in mind that our sin was bore on the cross, we're going to have no problem when, when another Christian in love comes to us and says, hey, I see that you've been pretty selfish lately, or something like that. A sin that you're really dealing with. Your anger is really a problem. And they're saying it to you in love. Guess what? We're going to say, hey, thank you for revealing that to me and confessing it as sin. Confess it as sin. Repent of it. Okay? And so, I guess really the key question is, why am I correcting someone? Why am I correcting or confronting a person? Why am I taking this log out of my eye so that I can pick up a speck in someone else's? It's because we love. It's because Christ loved us so much. He died for us. We want to love other people. And so we love them by confronting them and helping them. Okay? In scripture, we're not told to be judgmental, we're told to judge. Okay? And I think that's what it comes down to. If you go through scripture, you see that within the church specifically, it exhorts us in 1 Corinthians that we're to judge when there is interpersonal conflict within the church. Okay? Matthew 18 is a, is a, is a great example. 1 Corinthians 6, if there are two believers within the church having problems, guess what? We're to encourage them to go, one, go to one another. Okay? If that doesn't work, bring some more people in. Okay, bring someone else and try to work it out. If that still doesn't work, it's to go to the church. Okay, we're to deal with the unity problems that we have. 1 Corinthians 5 says that we're to deal with immoral behavior when it comes into the church. We're not just to stand back and say, oh, that's, you know, who am I to judge? God will judge them. No. We're to say, this is God's standard. This is how we are to live, okay? If, 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 if someone is living in, open, in an openly sinful relationship, in adultery, or someone's cheating on their wife, guess what? We need to, in love, confront it, okay? It says also in Matthew 18, we're, we're to deal with sin when someone sins against us, okay? We're to, to confront sin. In 2 Timothy 4, that we are to deal with sin when, when placed in positions of spiritual responsibility, we are to judge, okay? As leaders, people, people that are given leadership over God's church, guess what? We are to make judgments based on the word of God, not our own opinions. We're also judged to maintain doctrinal purity. If someone is, is spouting off some kind of doctrine that is not in God's word, guess what? We are to say that is wrong. That's not scriptural, okay? We're to judge. And we're also to judge in Titus when church unity is threatened, okay? God's unity, the unity of his church is more important than the prevailing statements that are going on these days. Oh, well, who, I, who, who are you to judge? Guess what? God is the judge. He's given us the judgment book. Here's the judgment. We're sinners. We need Jesus. Okay? Our judgment is not to be of our own. We must judge other believers humbly. Okay? Here's the second point, and we're going to wrap things up. We're called to judge unbelievers wisely. Judge unbelievers wisely. Notice I have the word unbelievers here. Last one was, was we were talking about believers, okay? If you look at Matthew chapter 7, uh, verse 6, here's the last verse we're going to cover today. It says, Do not give to dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot, and then turn and attack you. Okay, I, I heard someone say this week, one of these leadership guys that I follow on Twitter, he said this, Don't wrestle with a pig. You both get dirty, and the pig liked it. <laughs> it's true, okay? And so, so this is an arresting statement here. As, as Jesus wraps up what he's talking about, about judging, he says that, yes, we are to judge believers, but there are certain people that, guess what? They're just not going to take it, okay? And so guess what? We're going to have to also make a judgment of whether or not they can receive it. And so he's speaking about dogs and pigs, okay? Don't think of a dog as that nice little white 
dog that you have running around, yippity, yippity, you know, those little yippity dogs. You know, that's not the kind of dog Jesus is talking about here. He's, he's talking about if you've ever been to Guatemala or some foreign country, it's like those scavenger dogs, okay? Those dogs that are wild, okay? Think of more like a wolf or a coyote or something like that, okay? That's the kind of dogs that he's speaking about, okay? Don't give what is holy to dogs, okay? And, and then he, he speaks about pigs, okay? He says, don't give pearls to pigs, okay? Now, back then, I have something with, with me today just to use as an example. A, a pearl was something that was very valuable, okay? Pearl was something that, that you know, they found, and it was more precious than, than rubies or gold. It was something that was really, really special, okay? And so it, was, so it was very incredibly valuable. He said, don't give those things that are valuable to pigs. Don't, don't, don't drop it in with their food, okay? And, and you know, they're chomp along. <laughs> and they get mad, right? And then they attack you, right? That's kind of the illustration he's using. He's saying, guess what? When you give those things that are special, that are priceless, to pigs, they're not going to appreciate it. They're going to get angry, and they're going to attack you, and you're going to get messed up in the mud, okay? What's a pearl? What's a pearl? I would say, as, as scholars agree, the pearl, a pearl, is the truths of the gospel, okay? And he's saying, don't give pearls to pigs. Now, is he here talking about all unbelievers? See, he's saying, don't give the gospel to unbelievers. That can't be. No. He's saying, don't give the gospel to those that are going to ridicule you, going to drag my name through the muck, that are going to violently oppose us, make my name a mockery. If they're not going to receive it, and they're just, they're just going to get mad and try to attack you, guess what? It's best that you don't even give it at all, okay? And that requires making a judgment. That's a hard, that's a hard line to follow there because, yes, Jesus loves everyone. He does, and the gospel is for everyone, but there's a time and a place maybe to give it or withhold it, okay? Pearl is the gospel, Later in Matthew chapter 10, verse 14, he, he taught his disciples, if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, guess what you're to do? Shake off the, the dust from your feet when you leave that town and just, just leave it with them. Okay? Just leave. If they're going to be opposing you in that way, if they don't want to receive the gospel, then guess what? Say, well, I've got more people to tell that are going to listen. And so you shake off your feet and you leave. When a person rejects the gospel, that's a hard thing. But should you self-righteously puff yourself up and think, oh, well, I guess I'm better than them? No. No. As Jesus illustrated for us when he approached Jerusalem, guess what he did? He wept because he saw that they were like sheep without a shepherd. Okay? Okay. And so as we close, in summary, there is bad, self-righteous judgment that we are not to give, okay? That judgment that only puffs, our, puffs ourselves up, that makes us look better, okay? Hypocritical, that, that's not what Jesus wanted us to do. And then there is good, righteous judging that we are to practice. And that is incredibly difficult, but it is the key to the gospel, okay? In Sunday school a few weeks ago, we, we went through a whole series, I think three or four weeks, talking about judging. And I think some of us came out of that not really understanding, saying, well, no, I don't think we're to judge. You know, saying things like that, I just can't judge someone else. But guess what? If you still think that, I, I hope that you're rethinking that because guess what? The gospel depends us depends on us judging, okay? Realizing someone maybe in our, in our church, someone in our work doesn't know Jesus, okay? That requires us making a judgment call saying, well, I get, 
they haven't received Jesus as their Savior. The only way to heaven is through Christ, right? You've got to make a judgment and say, I've got to tell this person about Jesus because he's going to hell if he doesn't know. You've got to judge. And then you've got to make a second judgment call and say, Scripture says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I've got to tell them that he needs to repent. He needs to believe. That requires us telling him that he is a sinner, that he's bound for, for eternity in hell. Okay, That is a judgment. And if you are not willing to make that judgment, then you, you don't understand the gospel because the gospel is a judgment in itself. We're sinners. We need a Savior. We need Christ's righteousness. It's the only way to the kingdom. Brings me to the last verse. If you look at verses 7 and 8, we'll close with these. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks will find. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Okay? When we ask God for mercy and for grace, we receive it, don't we? If you haven't asked God yet, ask him today. He gives us his righteousness, his grace, his mercy. It's the only way to be saved, through Christ alone, okay? Fortunately, fortunately for us, Jesus dealt with our log, didn't he? So let's, let's not keep it in our eye. Let's look at others through, through, through the lens of the cross, have cross-shaped glasses on whenever we're about to approach someone and say, hey, I love you. Jesus, he paid for your sin. Get out of it. Stop living that way. Live for him. Let's pray. God, we're grateful for your words today. Lord, I, I pray that your word would have been understood in a way that we could apply to our lives in wherever we go back to. Lord, our homes, our work, um, our, our schools. God, I, I know that uh, this is hard words and maybe hard words to understand. God, I pray that your gospel would be first and foremost in our lives, that we might go and proclaim it. That message of judgment, Lord, there's a time coming when you will return. We want to be ready. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor, appreciate it. Uh, just a few announcements before we close. Uh, I'm going to ask Precious. She wants to talk to you about this uh, Women of Faith thing coming up, so I'm going to ask her to come over. I'll just hold it. Okay. All right. Um, this is for all the ladies. Sorry. <laughs> in the church, I wanted to let you know, if you look at the top um, announcement in your bulletin, it's tour. That is put on by um, Women of Faith. They changed the name this year, and they're getting a lot of new speakers in for it. And our church is actually partnering with the Methodist Church in Sistersville. Um, Dr. Amanda Nichols from Sistersville Hospital is heading all that up. She's bought all the tickets already, and she really wanted me to encourage any of the ladies of the church to get a hold of her. The total cost is $195, and that includes your ticket, um, a hotel room, the bus that we take to get there, and a t-shirt. Um, and so this is uh, her number for those of you who are interested. It's 304-771-3072. And um, she still has a lot of tickets that she needs to get rid of, and she's hoping that a lot of ladies from the area can go. So it's going to be a really great time of speakers and music. It's Friday and Saturday, August 19th through the 20th. So there's already a few of us signed up to go. So come join us. Yeah, great. Thank you, Precious. Uh, uh, my, my wife and daughters have gone really been a good time. So I encourage you to do that, ladies. Uh, don't forget uh, Discovery. You know, you can sign up online for that. And, and uh, it's on the 28th there. So make sure you play, make plans to do that. Uh, and the uh, scholarship fund with the Women's Missionary Fellowship, they're, they're starting on July 1st through, uh, or 31st through uh, August the 14th. They're taking uh, donations uh, for uh, the scholarship fund for Allison Yader, who's entering college. So you can contribute to that by using your, uh, the envelopes in your, uh, in your uh, pew and writing, writing that's what it's for. Uh, the uh, announcements I have, uh, 
Precious and Jonathan are leaving this afternoon uh, for Wisconsin. And so just be praying for them. And I got a hand up. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I had that down. Thank you. The, their missionary, Women's Missionary Fellowship was scheduled uh, for the 7th, but it's been moved to August the 21st, ladies. August the 21st, Women's Missionary Fellowship. Thank you. I forgot. All right, let's close the prayer. God, time. God, thank you for your word. I thank you for Jesus Christ, Father, and, and for his, the price he paid for my sin and for all people who accept him as their personal Savior. God, help us today, each one of us, to have made that decision that we hope and that we have that help uh, in this world. And Father, then as we see our sin, it humbles us when, uh, at, at, that we can help others. God, that are, that are hurting in, in harm's way. So God, help us to be that light this week, I pray. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. You're dismissed.